So today we are in the Gospel of John chapter 6. Last time, chapter 6, we ended reading at verse 45. So I'm going to, going to include that verse for context. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Gospel of John chapter 6, beginning at verse 45. As Jesus continues teaching, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue, synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Interesting words. <laughs> Very strange in some areas. So last time we touched a little bit on verse 45 where Jesus says, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who is heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now, those who have a revelation from God the Father, those who have studied and listened to his word given through Moses and the prophet, those who really know the scriptures, of course, those are the Hebrew scriptures, uh, as we, we refer to sometimes as the Old Testament, they will come to his son, Jesus. And likewise, all who hear and learn from the Son also learn from the Father. We explored a lot of this at the end of the last teaching and also um, the, some of the parallels in, in Isaiah 40, uh, 54 and 55 that related to Jesus' teaching here. So you can review that video if you like. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next verse, verse 46. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Here again, and, and just... You got a mixed crowd he's teaching. Jesus is insisting and, and claiming his unique relationship to God the Father. He claimed a relationship and a connection with God the Father that nobody else have, had or has ever done, literally. People's belief in that or even their unbelief does not alter the fact that Jesus is from God. He has seen the Father. He is God in the flesh. Um, the seeds of doubt that these uh, people were sowing into the crowd during Jesus' teaching here, it didn't weaken his knowledge. It didn't make him shy about telling people about it. And in fact, it was, uh, you know, it was something where, where he uh, exuded more of the assurance of this. You know, he was there teaching theologians. He's teaching common people, all of them at the same time. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting teaching religious teachers about God be like if I was trying to be here and talk to actual pastors and, and, and doctorates of, uh, you know, of, of religion. It's like, I might be nervous. Jesus was not that way at all. <laughs> you know, he, he knew what he was doing. He's helping them see at this point things they've never seen before. That he, yes, there is one God. And in the first verse of the Bible, as we studied before, that God is listed in, in the Hebrew as Elohim. It's translated God, but it was first introduced, you know, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. It is both a singular word and a plural word at the same time, which kind of made people wonder, <laughs> are these people monotheists or are they polytheists? Uh, do they believe in one God or many gods? But see, we know that that is, you know, in the plural, that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These concepts were actually written about before the time that Jesus came, before he was born as a human, 
but it wasn't an easy one to grasp because they really had never seen it in the flesh. Um, even if the entire revelation of this, the whole teaching about the Trinity was, was listed out, and it was in, in, in various ways in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, it was hard for them to figure it out. And so Jesus came. He was right there in front of them. He was explaining it to them. I thought it was pretty cool. And he's talked about this concept several times already in, in John as we've gone through. And uh, in a little while, a few chapters, he's going to start talking about the Holy Spirit. We've already seen a role that the Holy Spirit played in, uh, in John the Baptist's birth, in John the Baptist's teaching, in the baptism of Jesus. But he's going to talk about a whole new aspect of the Holy Spirit these people had never thought about would happen. And that is uh, that the Holy Spirit would come and indwell, would be inside and live with, live with a believer and guide them. Because up till that time, the Holy Spirit had come upon people for a brief time for a specific purpose, but had not been in their life. So anyway, why is all this so important about, the, about you know, who God is, how he's made up? Um, the simple answer is that's who God is. Um, he doesn't owe us an explanation as to how he's put together, you know, how he, how he runs the universe. But the marvelous uh, blessing here is that he has chosen to let us in on some of the inner workings of himself and, and how the Godhead works. And, you know, there are some aspects of the, the incarnation of Christ, you know, God coming to earth in the flesh. They help us to understand God's plan of redemption for us. Know, knowing that the Father's love for us was so much and that the son's submission to the authority of his father and the father more so the, the will of his father knowing those things and that jesus was willing to make the sacrifice for us of his own accord it adds so much to our really finite limited understanding but even so we we still don't have to understand all of the ramifications of the trinity as three persons in a single divine being um, nor, nor do i think our mind can actually contain all that but again, it's who he is, and he wants to share his very essence, his very being with us personally. I think it's an awesome privilege and a blessing to be able to do that. So uh, our life lesson here, our first life lesson is that God blesses us with small glimpses of his glory in the Bible. Let's honor him with faithfulness to study his word. God blesses us with small glimpses of his glory in the Bible. Let's honor him with faithfulness to study it. Let's go to verse 47. Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Now, to, to coin a phrase, here we go again, in a good way. He who believes in me, believing in, trusting in, clinging to, relying upon, being committed to Jesus, results in him giving us everlasting life. I say here we go again because if you've been, been reading in John 15 times already in this gospel, it's talked about life. And today is a great, great time to talk about another aspect of life we haven't talked about before uh, in detail. So let's jump into that little rabbit trail. Now, when he's talking, this word is life. He, what is he, life is he talking about? I mean, everybody there was alive that he was talking to. Well, as it happens sometimes, uh, our English words fail us. And uh, a single word in English does not really convey the meaning uh, that, uh, the, that he's meaning. So in the, the language the New Testament was written in, which is Greek, it was translated from Greek, there are multiple words for our word life. And of course, one of them is the breath. I'm alive, I'm moving. I'm, you know, trees live and plants live. There's some sort of a, a growth life breath in them. Uh, the second word, a life, could mean your lifetime. You know, I hadn't seen that in all my life. Well, that doesn't mean I haven't seen it. While I'm breathing right now, it means my entire lifetime. And sometimes it means from the beginning to the end of your life. Um, but then the word, another word for, translated for life is this one that Jesus uses. And when he promises to give life to those who believe, and I checked these references, the word in Greek is zoe. If you're a scholar, you probably know a better way to pronounce that, but that's the way I say it. Zoe, which has, and this is how Zoe is defined. The life is defined that he's talking about. It is the absolute fullness of life, both essential and ethical, which belongs to God. Real life, genuine life, 
A life active and vigorous, devoted to God, a blessed life that continues after the resurrection to be consummated by the process of coming into possession of higher rights and possessions, among them a more perfect body that is to last forever. Okay, it's a long, a long meaning, but all that is packed in that word. So when he says, I will give you life, that's what he's talking about. And in fact, when Jesus adds the word eternal life or everlasting life in front of it, um, it's not defining the type of life as we do in English. In English, we say, oh, it's eternal life. That means it's, we're living, but eternally. No, he's, he's, he's emphasizing it. He's not just saying, you know, you have this eternal life. He's saying you have eternal, really, really eternal, everlasting life in God, the life God wants you to have. So um, when you see Jesus say life, you know he's talking about the life eternal with God. When you see him say everlasting life, he's emphasizing it. And in verse, uh, the beginning of the verse, um, King James says, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you, and um, New King James says, Most assuredly, but that's, uh, the original says, Amen and Amen. And it means absolutely, I tell you the truth, I tell all of you this truth, and it's not going to change. This is, what the, <laughs> this is what the deal is. So it's a, it's a short word to say a lot. And so he's really emphasizing that to take away any doubts whatsoever about the kind of life that believers will have that believe in him. Full confidence, no doubts, no questions, absolute assurance. And, and the offer is for all who hear his word, not just a few. And if that is, seems like I'm repeating myself a lot, that's his intention in this passage. He wants people to know that. Many times when I'm sharing the gospel with people, I'll ask them if they know for sure. Do you have eternal life with the Lord after this life is over? And, uh, or as they understand it, you know, are you going to go to heaven after, after something happens to you today? Um, you know, walk out in front of a truck or, you know, airplane crash or whatever the situation. And many people respond with, a, with something like, I hope so. I tell you, I love that response. Um, gives me an opportunity because I know there's two things going on. I know, first of all, they want to have that assurance. And second of all, they really don't know, but they're open to knowing for sure. And, and so I help give them that assurance and share the gospel with them. Uh, other times I'll ask something like, if something happens to you and you die today from zero to 100%, how sure are you that you're going to have eternal life? So any answer that is not, well, zero, I'm absolutely sure I'm going to hell. People will say that to you. And others will say, absolutely, 100% sure I'm going to heaven. And any answer in between those two, and hopefully the 100% knows why, according to the scriptures. Um, Jesus is the only one that gives that absolute assurance. There is no other uh, religion or any other way to get to God that anybody, that, you know, to cross the, the the world, there's no other way that gives you an absolute assurance except for Jesus Christ. So anywhere, anything other than zero or 100%, it's an opportunity to share the gospel, to share Jesus' clear teaching in this passage with them so that they know. And we pray that the Holy Spirit, at that point, if we're talking to someone, we pray the Holy Spirit has already been drawing them to himself, has already been speaking to him. It's nothing we're saying, it's what God is saying to them. And it's wonderful because God is about to change their life forever. Uh, so our life lesson here is there is no doubt or question when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he most assuredly gives you eternal life. There is no question or doubt when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he most assuredly gives you eternal life. Now that's incredible enough to discover, but there's actually even more. Um, just think of the astounding nature of this claim, especially to the people that were, that were there. No other prophet or holy man in the Bible um, or even out of the Bible ever said such a thing before. Believe in me and I'll give you everlasting life. He, no one else claimed to exist from eternity or claimed to exist into eternity as Jesus does. And nobody else demonstrated the power of God with the love and compassion, the signs, the miracles, and uh, you know, even showing the, the power that he had over death and life. But Jesus makes these ideas even clearer as we continue. So another quick life lesson is only Jesus and no one else can give you eternal life. Only Jesus and no one else can give you eternal life. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. 
Jesus continues. We've actually been on a couple of weeks on this theme of bread because he had fed the 5,000 earlier and now they were coming back to him looking for bread like Moses gave them. And that's why, um, you know, he's going to go on and tell about that. But bread as a physical food is necessary for physical life. Um, it's also for, for a spiritual life. Jesus is absolutely necessary for that, that life. So that's a metaphor Jesus continues to use because it was something at hand. It was something for easy for people to understand and grasp. Verse 49, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. You know, that's, <laughs> that's a little slap on them, you know? Um, you remember these people were trusting in Moses, you know, and it seemed that they were trusting Moses and, and being sons of Abraham to give them eternal life, to give them life at least. And it's almost as, as if he had fed them the physical manna and, and physically kept them physically alive in the wilderness. Well, it wasn't Moses. Like we discussed last time with the bronze serpent, people were putting their trust and their faith and their, their worship in the bronze serpent or in Moses, in, in, in the person or the thing that God had used to deliver them instead of putting their trust and faith in the God who had provided that and delivered them. So this is where, where Jesus uh, contrasts and actually tweaks their misguided thinking a little bit. It's like, they're, it's like they're saying, we follow Moses and, and he gives us food for life. And Jesus says, uh, your fathers ate that food. Look at your fathers now. They're dead. Um, <laughs> he tells them there's no comparison. The spiritual bread that Jesus offers is so much greater than the manna that the Israelites ate in the wilderness. But they ate, what they ate only gave them a temporary life. But belief in Jesus gives that eternal life. And again, verse 50 this is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the, wor for the life of the world. Now, without getting all Greeky and historical and cultural on you in that, that area, let me just say that the way Jesus was talking about Eating was not like eating a magic biscuit that just poof, you're, you're, you know, you're changed. The metaphor in that time of, of eating and drinking uh, of, some, of somebody was talking about a person's uh, taking someone into their innermost being. Uh, they would have understood, the common people would have understood that eating the living bread of Jesus was developing a relationship with him. This is something a lot of them had not heard about, not really thought about a relationship with God. They knew they're supposed to obey God. The um, religious leaders told them, you have to obey God, you have to follow these rules. But that relationship had kind of gotten lost. It's all through the scriptures, but it had kind of gotten lost in the day-to-day -day practice. So this is not a, a superficial desire to make Jesus an, an earthly king for them. Uh, he's talking about a deep, long-term, personal relationship that makes a difference in your life, not just the way you act around someone that's watching you, but the way you behave, the way you make decisions, even what you think about. So after he talks about being that living and that life-giving bread, then he connects his physical flesh to his future sacrifice on the cross for our sins. My flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So they understood what he was saying and the Jewish leaders began stirring things up again. At this point they did not like to hear that uh, and just please know that when we see the term the Jews in this passage it's not a it's not a um, condemnation of the Jewish faith okay it's talking about not talking about the people all through Israel it's talking about the religious and political leaders that by now in in Jesus ministry are trying to discredit him they're trying to keep people from believing in him they're thinking about their own power earthly temporary power and and trying to protect it so they were in the crowd they were trying to distract people uh, doing anything they could so when Jesus got on something that was really good and really deep you know it'd be like pinching your baby in church you know <laughs> making them scream and cry and everybody turn around and look get distracted <laughs> that's what they were doing and this time they, they took the very words of Jesus they latched on to him to try to uh, kind of make fun of what Jesus was saying verse 52 the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? I mean, 
Come on, guys. <laughs> oh, welcome. Come on in. So these Jesus, I mean, the, the, the Jews were willfully putting a show on here. Uh, it seems they were pretending to misunderstand what Jesus was saying and then kind of vocalizing that to stir up the crowd. He had just explained that the bread of his body would be given as a sacrifice to, the, to give life to the world, but they willingly twisted his word, uh, his, his words here to imply some kind of a bizarre cannibalism. And, uh, you know, just turned it and said, oh, we're going to eat your flesh? We're going to drink your blood? What, what, what's with that, people? Well, we're going to come back to that in just a little bit. But let's explore a little bit what Jesus meant by this. He explained plainly that by the, the bread, it was his flesh and was given for the life of the world. And in his soon coming work on the cross, when he gave his life as a sacrifice, pleasing to God the Father for us guilty sinners, it's not just a covering for sin like the old sacrifices were. Um, you know, it, it wiped it out. The word of the flesh here is a very strong use. And obviously, it's going to grab the attention of people and to vividly calls attention to himself uh, and the historical fact that Jesus did give himself, his own physical flesh, for the forgiveness of man's sin. Giving his flesh can only have one meaning, and that is his death. I mean, how much flesh can you lose and still be alive physically? So, you know, there, there's a word here. Uh, Jesus' words point to a death which is two different things in the, in the one sentence. He said, I will give. That means it was voluntary and planned. I will give. Voluntary and planned. And substitutionary. I will give it for the life of the world. I will give my life in exchange for the life of the world. So once again, we find parallel meanings in, in, both, in, in this passage that are both fully valid in Jesus' teaching. Um, and um, <laughs> along with his challenge to enter the, most, the, the closest and most intimate relationship with himself, he also refers to an atoning death he will die. So one of the things Spurgeon, as he reviewed this, he said, Now, brothers and sisters, the food of your faith is to be found in the death of the Lord Jesus for you. And oh, what blessed food it is. And... <laughs> You know, it's very interesting weaving these concepts together. The Lord declared that his death was going to be a substitutionary and atonement for the sin of the world. And also that since human life could not be saved unless there is proper food and drink, you know, your physical life couldn't be saved unless there's proper food and drink received, that your souls could not be saved without receiving his death as to feed you, to feed your soul. He explained that receiving him as bread was not simple, simply thinking of him as a great moral leader or a good man or a noble martyr. It was receiving him in light of what he had done on the cross for us, the ultimate act of love and humility for man. Our life lesson here is just as Jesus fully committed his life to save us, so should our lives be fully committed to Jesus for salvation. Just as Jesus fully committed his life to save us, so should our lives be fully committed to Jesus for our salvation. That's the fellowship we have for him. That's the commitment to each other. So let's see what Jesus responded to those words who were trying to confuse his teaching and, and twisting him. Verse 53, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. So what does Jesus do? He comes right back and tells them more emphatically the same thing that he just told them. He didn't fight with them. He didn't call them stupid names. You know, what he's saying here, what, what's he saying here by not addressing their divisive comments? Well, he's saying, you got to stop thinking about this as a theological debate. It's not a debate. you you got to take me into yourself, and you must come to me, and then you'll have real life. Let's not argue about this, guys. Let's just receive it. Enjoy the life I want to give you. So he, he explained the comments to him, not in a fighting manner, but with the same love and compassion that we've seen all through the gospel here. A sincere desire that all would think about and begin to understand what he was teaching them. And many did believe. Now we're going to see later, um, next week, <laughs> we're going to be talking about 666, okay? 
And you're thinking, in John? I thought that was in Revelation, but you'll have to check that out to see. Um, 666, think about that. Not a good thing. Let me take a moment to dispel something else here that could be confusing. And I, until I dove into it, I didn't really understand. He's talking about you know, drinking his blood and eating his flesh. And um, sometimes we think, oh, well, where does that connect? The communion, the Last Supper, right? We, you know, we talk about the drinking of the, the wine and the, the bread. Uh, and although the concept is related to the truth that Jesus is sharing here, that communion, he is not speaking of the ritual of communion at this point. Uh, and, and be careful. You may come across somebody who's, who's found some error here by mistakenly thinking that receiving the bread and wine that Jesus encouraged to do in remembrance of him is actually something that's essential for salvation. Jesus didn't say you have to drink wine and bread, <laughs> eat bread um, to have life. That's not what he said. But that's not the case here. Some have even advanced this, this text to be so tied to the Lord's Supper and gotten so deep in the error that, that they, were, they even gave, give communion to babies that can't believe for themselves at this point. Uh, but just in case the baby dies, he's had communion and he will, or she, he or she will, uh, will, will you know, be able to go to heaven. Or they put it in the mouth of people that are dead, saying, okay, we've got to get this to them before we put them in the ground so they can have that communion. They receive that, that Jesus in the cup. That's not what it is. Sorry, that's not what it is. And, and you may also chuckle a little bit at the idea here that the religious leaders are relating this to cannibalism and think it's crazy that someone might make such a doctrine. But guess what? There is a church, a very large church in the world based in Rome uh, that, that actually believes this and, and has this. They assure, their priests assure people that drinking the wine and and eating the bread that they give to him actually physically turns into the physical blood and Jesus and uh, and flesh of Jesus Christ, and they're taking that physically into them. Now, brothers and sisters, that's not at all what Jesus is talking about in this passage. It's not what he meant here. It's not meant what he meant in the Last Supper. So, how does it apply to us? Well, I think we've gone over that that, that fellowship, that intimate relationship he wants to have. And our life lesson is that now that you know the real meaning of this passage, you can help lead others out of error and into a deeper and fuller relationship with Jesus. Now that you know the real meaning of this passage, you can help lead others out of error and into a deeper and fuller relationship with Jesus. Now let's look back. Jesus desires that we receive him in the fullest sense. The crucified and risen Jesus must be received and internalized metaphorically eating, <laughs> or is there is no, there is no true spiritual life if that doesn't happen, no eternal life if you don't have that fellowship, that uh, internalization. Christ's death opens up the way to life. Men enter to that way by faith. Eating the flesh and drinking the blood is a striking way of saying this. In verse 54, um, Jesus said that the person who eats the, the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood will be raised up on the last day. That's the same promise that we studied back in verse 40. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him will be raised up the last day. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. This intimate relationship with Jesus reminds me of the same uh, the mystical, intimate relationship that God established back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2.24. He said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Well, what does that mean? That means when you get married, they cut one side off of one and one side off the other, and they sew you together and you're one flesh, right? No. Or that they, they cut off parts of their bodies and graft them onto the other one, their spouses. No. It signifies that deep spiritual connection that lasts to each other, that lasts a lifetime. Now, something interesting in another little side trail. I mean, my mind works weird sometimes. It's like, you know, when God gave them that saying that command about a man leaving his mother and father and joining to his wife, there weren't any mothers and fathers at that point in time. <laughs> that was before mothers and fathers had existed, before they had kids. Anyway, that's another concept to explore when we, if we ever get to Genesis. So let's keep going. In verse 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As a living father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, 
not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Again, Jesus again and continues to emphasize uh, not only this relationship, but also the long, long term when he speaks of a believer abiding in him, staying in him. And at the same time, he is promising to abide, to live in, to continue in, to merge into and be a part of single heart and mind, the hearts and lives of the believer. The sacrificed life of Jesus is our food and drink for hungry and thirsty souls. When we receive him and internalize him, crucified for us as a sacrifice for our sins, we, we truly abide in Jesus and he in us. Mutual relationship. In this response to the people that were twisting his words, he made the metaphors stronger, not weaker. He didn't back down from the truth. I am the bread of life and the substance of that bread as his sacrifice on the cross. What he gave at the cross, we must receive. So important. He talks about it over and over again. There's a reason for that. It's really important. He lives in them. They in him. They're made partakers of the divine nature. Um, and those who do come to Jesus, believe on him, feed on him, they will live. Not because they have found an answer somewhere or because they have earned that life. <coughs> but because Jesus has freely given it to them. He's proven his power over death that he won at the cross. He's proved his power by rising. And in this eating and drinking, we are not producers, but we're consumers. What? We're not doing things. We're not givers. We take it in from him. Eating, what is eating? You don't give things when you eat. Eating is an act of receiving, and so it is with faith. Faith is not something to do or to feel, but to receive. Jesus offers this heavenly bread for eternal life, but we must eat it. Faith in Jesus is not compared with tasting or admiring. Oh, this is wonderfully tasting, or it looks great, but with eating. Jesus says that we must have him within us and partake of him. So think about that, brothers and sisters. That, you know, just seeing that bread on a plate is not going to satisfy your hunger. Same with the gospel of Jesus. Knowing what's in the bread, that's not going to satisfy your hunger. So with, so with Jesus. Taking pictures of the bread, even posting them on Facebook and telling other people how to find the bread, that is not going to satisfy the hunger of your soul. Jesus said, what? He who eats this bread will live forever. It's your choice. Partake in the life. I encourage you to partake in the life that Jesus is offering you today. Um, church is a great place to learn. The house of God. This is the house of God today. Uh, it's a great place to begin your journey and to continue your journey of taking in Jesus. Building that relationship with him. And we, we uh, conclude in verse 59. These things he said in the synagogue as he, caught, as he taught in Capernaum. So all of it happened in the house of God. Uh, and so uh, it's a great place to let the Lord speak to your heart. Think on these things, friends. Partake of Jesus. And as we close up with the, the teaching, we'll chat about it a little bit more if you like. But I want to pray a blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you for being here today. We hope the Lord is blessing you as you're here.